Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study Television, a television program designed to take you through the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation in one year, it is very exciting. We're glad you decided to join us. Also helping us is Corey. Corey, what are you doing? Well, today we are going to be taking a look at ancient expectations for the Messiah, for the Anointed One, as well as the archaeology of the Pool of Bethesda. Excellent. And you've put together some studies. What is it? Today we're going to look at two verses in John's Gospel, John 3, verse 26, and John 4, verse 2. Excellent. And Ryan is here. Ryan, what's up? Well, today I'm talking about a supposed cosmic contradiction in the Bible. More on that later. A cosmic contradiction. Very good. Later on in the program, I'm going to be teaching on the following. Jesus Christ reaches out to a Samaritan woman, and he is in physical weakness. Can you imagine that? He uses this weakness to get her attention. And that he dis displays a whole teaching that's absolutely fascinating. All of that and more is coming your way, so get your Bible guide out in your Bible as we continue to study right here on Quick Study. John chapter 4, we have this very interesting, very socially awkward and taboo situation that Jesus purposely gets himself into when he makes conversation with a Samaritan woman. Now she had expectations of a Messiah. Through several passages of scripture and even more themes present in the Old Testament of the Bible, a special Messiah or anointed one came to be expected by the Jewish people. This expectation makes sense of Jesus' requalification of the true role of the Messiah and his situational refusals to make public his Messiah claim. In order to understand the concepts or expectations of the Messiah that existed during the days of Jesus, we must turn to ancient Jewish literature from the time period between the closing of the Old Testament and the opening of the New. From them, we find an intriguing diversity of opinion. During and immediately following the Maccabean revolt that gained Judea a type of independence, it appears that many came to believe that the Hasmonean dynasty, those priests who had taken power as kings, replaced the need for an actual messiah. They were seen as filling that messianic role. At the same time, some were unsatisfied with the corruption of the dynasty and saw instead of a priest-king messiah, the need for two separate delivering messiahs. They began to look for an anointed priest from the tribe of Levi and an anointed king from the tribe of Judah. Still others looked for a warrior messiah, someone like David and the judges of old who would come and deliver them from the oppression of Rome. Another view saw the Messiah as more of a sage, a great teacher, while the Samaritan people were looking specifically for a type of new Moses, a political deliverer who would teach the ways of God. This diversity of belief goes a long way in explaining why sometimes Jesus fully accepted the title of Messiah, while at other moments he demanded his disciples to stay quiet on the issue. Jesus had a mission to fulfill and a role as Messiah that was outlined by God's interpretation of the scriptures, not man's. Now, it is really easy for us just to kind of fall back on a generalized assumption that the Jews were all expecting a political messiah, a, a warrior messiah who would free them from the bonds of Rome and any other kingdom that would come against them. But as we can see, uh, demonstrated through history, Judaism was extremely diverse in its views before the fall of the temple in AD 70. And this includes their messianic expectations so that really opens up for us in John chapter 4 here, uh, when the Samaritan woman realized that Jesus was the Messiah and she believed it so easily, um, the Samaritans were expecting more of a teacher.
teacher, more of a rabbi messiah, and that's what they got plus more. See, Jesus just right out came and said, yes, I am he to this woman. And he spent two days uh, with the Samaritans and, and gained a huge following. Now, this came back to bite Jesus, not really, but, but socially, it, it, it uh, lost Jesus even more fans uh, when he was accused later on uh, after teaching in the temple complex, you know, they, they said, uh, you are a Samaritan and you have a demon. They accused him right out of being a Samaritan and, and make no mistakes about it. Uh, that was not a compliment. The Samaritans, you know, uh, Jewish men weren't even supposed to talk to Samaritans. You just didn't even associate with them because they were seen as so perverse. God's power is remarkably strong in the shadow of humankind. We live and design our world around the cost of sin. Everything we do and live with includes the heavy burden of sin. It is said that death is the cost of life, but the Bible tells us that death is the result of sin. When Jesus Christ grew weary from traveling, he sat and spoke with a woman from Samaria. This was unusual and shocking for those times. Jesus Christ also used this time to clarify his power for the Samaritans. The Lord told the woman that if she knew who she was speaking with, she would ask for water to quench her thirst forevermore. John chapter 4, verses 1 through 14. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. John chapter 4, verses 1 through 14. As we carry on through the Gospel of John, we learn a couple of things about Jesus Christ that are unrealized in the previous Gospels. First of all, John is written to the church, and that's very important. We need to understand that, and as we continue to study it, we'll learn more about that. But if you don't have your Bible guide, why not? Write for it, send an offering in any amount, use the American address or the Canadian address or the British address. We'll be happy to send it to you. Or you can go to www.biblediscoverytv.com. 
That's www.biblediscoverytv.com and click on donate, make a donation. We'll be happy to send you to the PDF files. And also, by the way, there's an all music 24 seven radio station there that I use when I'm studying and for the Bible guide and all that stuff, it's excellent. So you can listen to that as well. Now, as we begin to look at this, is, this is really interesting. Um, the steps of faith tell us something about Jesus Christ. Really, Jesus Christ grew weary. And we say, what does that mean? We read John chapter 4 through 5 as we continue to go through the entire Bible in one year. We're looking at John chapter 4, verses 1 to 14. And as we explore this scripture, let's slow it down. Janice has already read it for you. But let's slow it down and read carefully and listen to what the scripture says. John chapter 4, verses 1 to 8. It says, therefore... When the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize, his disciples did. He left Judea and departed again to Galilee. He needed to go through Samaria. So he came to the city of Samaria, which is called Sinchar. And it's uh, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Now, Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, tired from his journey, sat by the well. And it was about the sixth hour. So a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Now, this is absolutely stunning. Jesus Christ, in a physical weakness, reached out to a Samaritan woman. We must realize that God's strength is greater than our weakness. Now, first of all, you need to know a couple of things. Number one, Jesus Christ knew what he was doing. He understood exactly what was going on. He knew the woman. He knew, he understood what she was going through and all of that. He, he got all that. And secondly, it's important to realize that Jesus Christ uses his own condition to appeal to the woman. And he says, please give me some water. Isn't that amazing? And as we look at this, we need to consider what Jesus Christ is doing. What is he doing? Well, let's read the scripture and find out. John chapter four and verse nine says, then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me? a Samaritan woman, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. This is absolutely amazing too. The woman was shocked when Jesus Christ spoke to her. Jews did not do that, but Jesus Christ was more than a Jew. He was and is the son of God. See, if Jesus Christ is the son of God, if Jesus Christ is, is part of the Godhead, then it makes sense for us to realize that he is the God of everything, everything. And so while the people are sort of gathering together and talking about, well, you know, Jesus is a Jew, he's for the Jews, he's for the Jews, you know, and just keep it to the Jews. Well, Jesus Christ is concerned with everyone. Now that is something that we'll learn when we get into the book of Acts and it's going to come together, and it actually comes with the disciples, but it's going to come together in Acts chapter 15. God's going to deal with this, because this is important. Let's go on. And chapter 4, verses 10 to 14 say it this way. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, then you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Living water? Yes, living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? And you are greater than our father Jacob. Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Well, Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst again. 
but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, this is absolutely amazing. You see, Jesus Christ said that when he enters our life, when he comes into our life, everything changes. Everything changes. When we accept God and his truth, he gives us eternal life. Now, you know where this is really important? Today. When people go to church, they usually say, well, I'm going to go to this church because I, I need to see what I can get from it. No, you go to church to see what you can give, not get. Everybody's talking about what they can get from it. Let me tell you something. You go to church to praise God, to listen to the scripture, listen to the teaching, and to praise God, beloved. This is so important because Jesus Christ, when he comes into your life, gives you that well of water that makes you a source of giving rather than a source of taking. And if we're a source of taking all the time, then we need to get with Jesus and say, Lord, help me. And you can do that very clearly by reading his scripture every day, praying every day and asking God to help you. Whatever it is or wherever you're dealing with, God will help you. We see demonstrated very clearly in the Gospel of John that Jesus really wasn't trying to win any popularity contests. I mean, he had a huge following of Samaritans. Uh, he uh, openly opposed some of the religious leaders and uh, he also healed on the Sabbath. John chapter five records a curious healing miracle of Jesus. On a certain Sabbath day, Jesus went to the pool of Bethesda in Jerusalem, a pool that is said to have had five porches or porticos. There he found a sick man who had trouble moving. The common legend of the pool is said to have been that an angel would come and stir the waters, which offered healing to the first person to immerse after the stirring. Due to this belief, hundreds of the sick would pack into the five porches to wait and try to enter the pool. Among these sick pilgrims, Jesus singled out this infirm man and healed him with a simple command to get up and carry his mat. In the late 1800s, an ancient pool was discovered north of the Temple Mount that was found to have five porticos, four along its outside rectangular shape and one that stretched across the horizontal middle of the pool. Also discovered were archaeological clues pointing to the pool's importance within Christianity and as a place revered by the Romans as a healing site. A Byzantine era Christian church was built on top of the pool's center portico, as well as a later crusader chapel. Just east of the Byzantine church, ruins of shrines and baths dedicated to the Roman god of healing were excavated. Clearly, this pool had very early on been identified not only as a pagan healing site, but also as a place important to early Christianity. Recent interpretations on the purpose of this pool of Bethesda suggest its use as a public mikvah, allowing the Jewish population to maintain their ritual purity. Wide and gradual steps and landings span the lengths of the southern pool's porticos, which would make descending into the water possible at varying water levels. The northern pool would then act as a reservoir, letting water travel from the northern pool to the southern through a door in the middle wall. This not only regulated the water levels in the southern pool, but also allowed the water to become ritually clean by having contact with flowing water. In our modern world, skepticism has risen to an all-time high. God has been cast aside and the Bible has been accused of being full of lies. This all started when the father of lies first questioned God's word in the Garden of Eden. Did God really say? It is then, no surprise, that after thousands of years of Satan spewing lies, doubt about God's word is at a record high. Unfortunately, the church is not void of this attack either. In fact, many, especially the youth, are becoming increasingly skeptical and abandoning the church and their faith altogether. This due largely to the lie that the scriptures contain errors and contradictions. 
How can we, as believers, combat this deception? Join Ryan Hembry in this month's special DVD offer as he both seeks the Word of God for strategy against the evil plot and dismantles the deception that the Holy Scriptures contain errors and contradictions. To order your copy of Crisis of Faith, Why Young People Are Leaving the Church, simply contact us and we would be happy to send it to you for a gift of $25 or more. Order your copy today. Thank you for staying with us here on Quick Study Television as we continue to go through the Bible. It is absolutely stunning. And today I'm going to tell you what we're going to do on the next program. It is this. A woman caught in the act of adultery is brought before Jesus Christ. Now what in the world is Jesus Christ supposed to do with this woman? Well, the Pharisees and the Sadducees said stoner. We'll talk about that next time on Quick Study Television. Right now, Ryan is here, Ryan. Well, it's not Wednesday, but today we have an alleged cosmic contradiction found within the Bible, and I thought it would be fitting for Space Friday. Now, you've probably heard this one a lot from critics before. They'll say, the Bible promotes an outdated and incorrect cosmology because it says things like the Earth is flat. But are any of these allegations true? Many believe that the Bible contains an outdated and wrong cosmology. For example, critics claim that the scriptures declare the earth to be flat and not a globe. This accusation is based on both Isaiah 11:12 and Revelation 7:1, where the phrase, the four corners of the earth, is used. However, the fact is that the expression was common in ancient times and is still used by many educated individuals today not to refer to a flat earth, but to indicate either the whole of planet Earth or the four extremities of the globe as viewed on a map from a central position. Furthermore, the Bible in multiple places refers to or assumes the sphericity of the Earth. Consider Isaiah 40, 22. It is he who sits above the circle of the Earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. The English word circle was derived from the Hebrew word chug, meaning sphere. Again, we read in Job 26.10 that God drew a circular horizon on the face of the waters, at the boundary of light and darkness. This verse again refers to the circle of the earth, and also adds the phrase, at the boundary of light and darkness. This infers the sphericity of the earth, since if the earth were flat, then there would be no boundary of light and darkness. It would be either day or night. In Luke 17, 34-36, Jesus also alludes to earth's sphericity. He says, I tell you, in that night there will be two men in one bed. The one will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken and the other left. Two men will be in the field. The one will be taken and the other left. Notice in verse 34, it is nighttime. But in verses 35 and 36, it is day. How could this coming event occur at both day and night? This is only possible with a spherical Earth, where for half the globe it is daytime, and for the other half, nighttime. Critics of the Bible are in error. The Bible never claimed that the Earth is flat, but rather proclaimed its sphericity before it was ever scientifically proven. As we can see, this accusation against the Bible is completely unfounded. Actually, this argument critics use can be turned on its head because scientists didn't prove that the Earth was spherical until modern times, but the Bible written thousands of years ago already included this as its cosmology. Next Friday, we'll look at another accusation made against the scriptures. Very interesting. Uh, accusations against the scripture and all of that. This is fascinating stuff. I'm charged up by this, Ryan. Excellent. <laughs> Uh, you studied as yes. well, and what did you come up with? Well, we're taking a look at the book of John, and I really appreciate John's writing style, and I want to show something where he's actually clarifying something that he says earlier. So if we go back to John chapter 3, verse 26, it says in verse 25 that there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews. We're talking about John the Baptist's disciples and the Jews about purification. And verse 26 says, And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, 
He who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. They're referring to Jesus baptizing. Well, if you go down now to John chapter four, verse two, John clarifies exactly what he was saying. And that is this. Uh, therefore, verse one of chapter four, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, and here comes the clarification. In parentheses, John says, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. So I just, I, I wanted to make mention that John is very specific. He is very clear. He wants us to understand exactly what the meaning is and what he is saying. He doesn't want us to take out of context what he's talking about. Because if you take it out of context, then if you take the Bible out of context, then you're, everything is a pretext. That's right. So it wasn't Jesus that was doing the baptizing. That's right. It was people that were coming to him and his disciples were doing the baptizing. Which I find absolutely interesting. Yes. Um, because the disciples are the ones who are you know, immersing the people in the water. Well, and Jesus had given that command, go yeah. out and make disciples and baptize them in the name of... Uh, yeah, the uh, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the interesting thing about this is that it's also talked about in 28th chapter of Matthew. Very interesting. The reality of knowing God as Lord of our life is through Jesus Christ, the life-changing event. We are not the same. Our character and personality grow to unimaginable levels. In fact, the levels that we reach are unattainable by any other way. If there is no growth and change, we must ensure that we make Jesus Christ Lord of our life. When we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we come realizing that we need help and forgiveness of our sins. We will be destroyed unless we say yes to the Lordship over our life. At the end of the program, it is great to tell you about Jesus Christ, who's Lord. He came, he died on the cross, he rose again. And now if we invite him, pray and invite him and say, Lord Jesus Christ, come into my life, then he will come and he will take over. And there's a lot of things that are problems in our life that God completely comes in and he gives us wisdom and he gives us ability to deal with them. Invite Jesus Christ into your life today. Come to Jesus.